So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Simple Solutions for Eating Healthy with Heidi Pinsky. My name is Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a 37-year-old nonprofit organization that helps people through breast or ovarian cancer, offering the unique support of survivors who've been there. Our services are free of charge and include helplines, support groups, educational programs, and public health initiatives. For more information, visit our website at www.sharecancersupport.org. So let me tell you a little bit about the format of the program and how you can participate. All, participate. all participants are muted so that we can all clearly hear the presenter. If you have a question during or after the presentation, please submit the question through the question pane on your control panel. You can access the question pane by clicking on the red arrow in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Once the presentation is over, we'll open up for questions, and I'll fill the questions and read them to the presenter, and then she will go ahead and answer the questions. So let me introduce Heidi Pinsky. Heidi has more than 10 years of experience as a registered dietitian. Her work experience has been in various nutrition, public health, corporate wellness, and healthcare settings with a strong focus on HIV, diabetes, weight management, in pediatrics. Heidi's background provides expertise in partnering with patients to make positive informed choices about food and nutrition. She's passionate about the role healthy eating and proper food choices play in weight management, preventive health, and quality of life issues. As the chief nutritionist, nutritionist for Mamamides Cancer Center, Heidi works closely with patients and the medical team providing individualized eating plans to reduce treatment side effects and improve overall health. She's also involved in community education through various seminars, cooking demonstrations, and health fairs. Her goal is to help you find practical, culturally appropriate ways to stay well nourished while undergoing cancer treatment. So I'd, I'd like to thank Heidi for, for this presentation. She is so incredibly busy as the Chief Nutritionist at Mamamides, and so thank you so much for being here, Heidi. Oh, thank, thank you, Christine. It's my pleasure to be here um, and to be able to give all this information to everyone. So uh, I will get started then. So today uh, we will discuss simple solutions for eating healthy. And although uh, my talk is geared towards those of you who have had breast cancer or ovarian cancer, my focus is also on the caregivers because they are as well under a lot of stress and the diet that I'm going to go over today is just a generally overall healthy way to live regardless of your experience um, and following uh, an overall healthy diet will give you a chance to have more increased energy, it will help you keep your weight at a, at a uh, reasonable level, and it will also give you all the nutrients that you need for your healthy lifestyle. So first I'd like to say that unfortunately breast cancer does remain the most common cancer among women in the United States, uh, but because now we have earlier detection, improved treatment, and great information about diet, it's one of the most treatable cancers um, as well. So there are a few things to know as far as risk factors. Now, there are genetic risk factors, as we know, um, for getting cancer. There are multiple risk factors. And some of them are more significant than others. Among the most significant are a high fat diet, obesity, and excessive alcohol consumption. So following a healthy diet can eliminate these risk factors.
Okay. During treatment, your nutrition needs were very different depending on the side effects that you experienced, and proper nutrition was important for your treatment outcome. I'm sure the caregivers also were noting that they're, you know, trying to keep up with proper nutrition during treatment was tough because their focus was mainly on uh, the patient they were caring for, the person they were caring for. So now that we're all past the treatment point, hopefully, uh, it's very, very important to maintain a healthy diet. So for some people, this may be a change that you're not ready to make yet, since I often hear on a daily basis that people want to treat themselves to, say, comfort food or what they consider to be fun food, because they felt that they, they had such a hard time during treatment, they really want to now treat themselves. But my philosophy is that making healthy changes sooner than later may help keep your cancer from returning. So studies definitely show that women who have a high body mass index post-treatment have an increased risk of recurrence. Now, body mass index is a measurement of your weight for your height. And it's the same for men and women as far as the BMI is concerned. It's not the only way to know um, how, you know, weight. You can, you can weigh a lot for your height, but you can be all muscle mass. But for most of the folks in this category, it's just basically being overweight. So I, I personally believe that a healthy diet shouldn't be viewed as an all or nothing approach. What I mean by that is that 90% of the time you should really eat healthy foods and the other 10% of the time you can safely eat the fun foods or the foods that give you comfort. So you're probably asking yourself, now that I'm a survivor, what do I do next to maintain a healthy lifestyle and reduce my risk of recurrence? Now, the caregivers can also ask themselves if they haven't experienced any health issues, how do I keep myself healthy and prevent getting any type of cancer and doing the best job that I can with the tools that I have? So if you, if you look at this picture, what you're looking at is basically a pie chart. And it's broken up into sections of the amounts of different types of food groups that we should eat. So if you see the largest portion of the pie is the fruit and vegetable category. The next largest is the bread or starch category. So it's very hard to put all the perfect foods into this picture, but if you'll see, there's some wheat, the words wheat, and hopefully whole wheat grains. Whole grains is what we really are striving for, and I'll get into that a little bit more specifically later on in the slides. So although you know fat is something that we need, and we have healthy fats in our suggestions, the smallest piece of this pie is the fat and sugar-containing food group. That's because the recommendation is to have as little of those foods as possible. Um, so as I said, I will get a, a little bit uh, more specific a little bit later on. So what is in a healthful and varied diet? I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible because I've found that if a diet is too restrictive or complicated, that most people will just give up and go back to their old ways. Um, so I'm going to try and break it down as best as I can. So the bulk of your diet, a healthy diet, should come from the plant foods. And this includes fruits, vegetables, whole unrefined grains, meaning not white flour, um, beans, lean proteins, such as fish, chicken, and turkey. So now you're probably asking yourself, well, 
What about everything else you didn't just mention? So everything else, everything else in the supermarket means that you should choose things that are minimally processed, OK? So buy fresh when possible. Try to avoid preservatives, chemicals, and sugars. If you would like some red meat, it's, it's not the healthiest of choices, but if you would like some, definitely go for fresh and minimally processed, OK? Processed means cold cuts, hot dogs, bacon, sausages, things like that. All right, keep in mind that the reason that I say try to go for fresh as opposed to processed um, foods is because salt or sodium is a, is a strong preservative, and it keeps foods on the shelves for a long time. So, you know, as a dietitian, I always recommend to people to shop on the perimeter of the supermarket where you have the fresh foods, the produce, the meats, the dairy, and try and avoid the aisles because stuff is sitting around for quite some time. OK, also, you want to avoid alcohol in excess. So what does that mean? Low, low alcohol content means no more than one drink a day for women and no more than two drinks a day for men. OK, and the last uh, topic on this slide is sugary drinks. Why sugary drinks? I don't mean just soda. I'm also including things like sports drinks or energy drinks like Gatorade, uh, vitamin waters, things like iced teas, fruit punch, or even Snapple. OK? Some drinks that sound healthy, such as V8 Splash or even smoothies, should be avoided. And I'll get, I'll get into that in a little while, why that should be avoided. But basically, these are all sugars that can then lead to weight gain. OK, so what is it about red meat and cancer risk? Why should we avoid the red meat? OK, there's something called heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Those are very long-named chemicals that are formed when muscle meat, such as beef, pork, fish, and poultry, is cooked using high-temperature methods, like pan-frying or grilling directly over an open flame. So in other words, barbecuing. OK, the formation of these chemicals is influenced by the type of meat you use, the cooking time, the cooking temperature, and the cooking method. Heme iron is an animal protein that binds iron. The heme can become stressed from the cooking when you have high temperatures and you cook quickly. Then at this point, the heme can be separated from the iron, which can then create free radicals. So free radicals basically create damage to the cells. So when you hear the term antioxidants, people are always talking about antioxidants. Those are the good guys that come in and clean up the garbage of the free radicals. So they try and do the reverse of the damage. And now the, the reason why we as dietitians are always pushing fruits and vegetables and large amounts of them is because they naturally have a great deal of antioxidants in them. So basically, you know, if you are going to eat red meat or barbecue your meat, um, studies have shown that less damage is done if you also eat some antioxidants along with it. So have that salad and vegetables with it. Not that it's a great idea to, to eat a large amount because your cancer risk increases when you eat more than the recommended amount. So in this case, the study was done, again, 
I should note that the studies have not been done on humans. They've only been done on animals, but I think it's very safe to say that humans should also pay attention to this to avoid uh, a risk of cancer and also just for overall good health. So the recommendation is that eating more than one pound of meat per week is not recommended, okay? So that's about two large burgers a week. So the, the best thing, oh, let me, let me go back for a moment. Um, the, best, the best way to avoid those uh, dangerous chemicals that are created by cooking the meat is to avoid direct exposure of the meat to an open flame or a hot metal surface. So, for example, if you're barbecuing, you want to put some foil or a barrier between the flame and the meat. You also want to cook it slow and low. You want to have a low flame, low temperature, and slowly, okay? You don't want to do flash frying because that also creates the chemicals. You can also use a microwave to partially cook your meat. This way, when you do put it on the grill, you can you know, have less cooking time and it won't be exposed to as much of the flame. Okay, so let's go now forward to the processed meat category and its cancer risk. Okay, consuming processed meats is definitely associated with a high risk of cancer. It's a greater risk than it is to eat red meat. Uh, the the category processed meats means whole cuts, hot dogs, bacon, and sausages. Basically, these meats have been preserved by smoking them, curing them, salting, or adding other chemicals and preservatives such as nitrates to them. Now, nitrates and nitrites are chemicals that are also used in fertilizers. They're also used in rodent pesticides as well as the food preservatives. So sometimes our meat can get the nitrates in them just by adding it as a preservative, but sometimes it can come from the animals themselves when they eat the grass or the grain that has been um, processed with these fertilizers. So basically, some foods have more than others. There is a small but growing category of processed meats that say they don't contain nitrates. And, um, you know, they would say so right on the label. They, they'll say natural. Um, some of the big name brands have them. There's a small brand that says no nitrates. And they don't have them, but it's also a lot of sodium added to these products to keep them preserved, because they have to preserve them in some way. So basically, I'm not saying that if you want them, don't look at them as a health food. You know, they should still be consumed in moderation. You might want to go with the better, the better brands that say they don't contain the nitrates. So, but there is convincing evidence that links processed meat consumption to colorectal cancer specifically. Now what about alcohol? Okay, alcohol has been linked to certain cancers, mainly kidney cancer, liver, head and neck, and breast cancer. But it also can increase the risk of others, just because those you know, other cancers aren't on the list, it's still a good idea to consume alcohol in moderation. Alcohol acts to increase circulating estrogen levels in the body. And we have all heard that red wine is very heart healthy. So again, we probably think, well, why not? Let's, let's drink to our health. I don't recommend that you start drinking to achieve the modest health benefits of wine. Um, and don't start. If you don't drink, don't start. 
But if you do drink wine, like I said, do so in moderation. But a better option or substitute would be eating fresh grapes, such as the red grapes, or drinking grape juice, and, and a small amount. All you need is about four ounces. Um, the heart health benefits from resveratrol, which is a nutrient in the grape skin. This is what the, the same nutrient that's found in red wine is being promoted as health, as a health uh, benefit. So now we're moving on to the next uh, big category, especially that's linked to cancer, sugar. Okay, there's a ton of myths that surround nutrition and cancer. And one of the biggest ones that I hear often is that sugar feeds cancer. So definitely taking in too much sugar, especially refined sugars that are found in sodas, candies, cake, cookies, things like that, this sugar causes the body to produce insulin. And the insulin manages the surge of sugar in your blood. So insulin is a hormone that can increase cell growth. The more opportunities that you create for cells to grow and divide in the body, then the risk of the, some of the cells mutating and becoming cancerous, is, cancerous increases. Okay, this is a similar concept that is found with weight gain and obesity. Now, when we have excess calories from things like soda or sugary drinks, and now back to the sugary drinks, those extra calories above and beyond what your body needs will go to storage, and storage is fat. So we don't want to take in those excess calories from sugar if we can avoid it. All right, so now on to the good stuff. What should I eat and how much of it should I eat? So if you see the picture, it's a, it's a nice little picture of uh, we have oil on the left, chicken in the middle, and vegetables on the right. Now this is 400 calories volume-wise of what each category looks like. If you see there's tiny, tiny little bit of oil but that's because oil is calorically dense. And if you look at the vegetables, the whole stomach is full. <laughs> so we definitely don't want to say stop eating oils. Healthy fats and oils are very necessary for our health. But since they are so calorically dense, we want to not have too much of them. They contain about 9 calories per gram. Now, chicken is a protein, which is also important, and it only contains four calories per gram. So vegetables, being uh, part of the carbohydrate group, also contain about four calories per gram. Well, carbohydrates do, anyhow. So calories are not equal, meaning you can't just say that 400 calories of oil, chicken, and vegetables are the same. The body processes them all in different ways. Vegetables are so wonderful because they can contain a ton of fiber. And fiber is a super important nutrient to have in your diet. It helps to keep your blood sugar stable. It helps to keep you full faster and longer than other foods. And it helps to keep your cholesterol levels down. Fiber also is a wonderful tool for bulking and softening the stool. So if you ever experience constipation, which many folks do, um, eating a lot more fiber is the way to go. Now, as I said as well, fiber is very helpful for keeping blood sugar stable. So if you happen to be a diabetic, fiber is going to be your friend. So fiber is going to regulate your, your blood sugar. And, and not to mention the, the fruits and vegetables are going to give you tons of vitamins and minerals naturally from, from the foods that you eat. So what should you go for? Okay, this is basically, this slide is the breakdown of a healthy diet. 
and the servings that are recommended daily. Fruits and vegetables are the most abundant. Okay, you should try to ideally get both of them. So it says five to nine servings per day. What is a serving? A serving is not that big, actually. A half a cup of cooked vegetables or one cup of raw vegetables. So if you're making a salad, that's easy to do. If you enjoy vegetables, it's very easy to do. But half a cup of cooked vegetables is kind of a small thing. If you make a fist, your fist is about a cup. So you can also count servings by pieces of fruit you're eating. Some, like large bananas, are counted as two servings. A serving of lean protein is only one ounce, so it's really easy to eat more than you need. A typical serving of protein foods, such as chicken, is about three ounces. And three ounces would look like the size of the palm of your hand without your fingers, or the size of a deck of cards. When you choose fats, you want to choose the fats that are healthy, such as olive oil or canola oil. And again, I'll get very detailed later on in the presentation about which fats to choose. So as I had said prior, fiber is a very important um, thing that you want in your diet. Now, fiber is easy to get enough of if you're getting all of your fruits and vegetable servings in. Try to le read labels when you do shop and look, look at the back of the um, nutrition label and the facts panel. It will say fiber grams. It'll be listed. So the more the better. When comparing breads, go for some that have more fiber. Okay. Also, when you read the ingredients, which is different than the nutrition facts panel, you want, say, one of the first ingredients to say whole wheat or whole grain. That means that it has more fiber. Some fiber is added. Certain products, like Fiber One cereal, for example, there's a certain type of fiber that is healthy and is added to the food. Those are called functional foods. So for water, it says six to eight cups of water. I also say calorie-free fluids because we don't want to have all of those sugary drinks. We want to avoid the calories, such as things like Snapple or Gatorade. Those aren't necessary. OK. Why should you eat a plant-based diet? In my opinion, you should eat it because it's delicious and healthy, but I know not everybody looks at it that way. <laughs> so the main reason is that plants provide us with a great amount of phytochemicals, which is really just a nice fancy way of saying plant chemicals, phyto being from the plant. These good for us chemicals work in the body to reverse some of the cell damage which you may have heard of, as I said prior, referred to as antioxidants. OK, we want those little fighters, those antioxidants, to, to clean up the cell damage that some of the other environmental things that have been going on and also from some of the bad foods that we've been eating. The best way to consume the maximum amount of phytochemicals is definitely from the foods you eat especially whole pieces of fruits or vegetables that haven't really been processed. And I'll give you an example. So if you have an orange versus orange juice, now the orange has all of the cell walls intact. It has all of the nutrients intact. And the orange juice has been concentrated. It's been processed. So the body isn't doing any of the work. And although the nutrients are still there, the body doesn't absorb it quite the same way. The body is really adept at extracting the nutrients it needs all the way from the chewing process down to the digestive process. So you take the fiber out of the orange when you juice it and you concentrate it and make it too high in sugar. 
Okay, moving on to the cruciferous vegetables. These are some of the best choices as a vegetable uh, in the vegetable category that you can make. So studies are suggesting that these cruciferous vegetables help regulate a complex system of bodily enzymes that defend against cancer. Components of these vegetables have shown the ability to stop the growth of cancer cells in various cell and tissue models, including tumors of the breast, endometrium, lung, colon, liver, and cervix. Studies have also shown that diets high in cruciferous vegetables lower the risk for lung, stomach, and colorectal cancers. Okay, these have really strong phytochemicals in them. So what are cruciferous vegetables? Which ones should I choose? Um, any of this list would be a great choice. Some people have uh, a little bit of a gas effect from eating, say, cabbage or Brussels sprouts, but you can certainly try kale, watercress, some of the more mild, less gas-forming cruciferous vegetables. But the best way to make sure that you're getting a variety is to try all of these choices. Okay, have fun with it. Later on, I'm going to provide you with the recipes that utilize some of these cruciferous vegetables. Okay, six, six tips to increase your fruit and vegetable intake. If you're not the kind of person who likes to eat vegetables as the main dish with your meal, try to sneak the fruit and vegetables in whenever possible. Okay, one example is by adding blueberries or bananas to your oatmeal or pancakes, even if you make pancakes, or adding vegetables to your pizza, okay? So some of the um, herbs and spices that I always like to include, garlic, ginger, rosemary, parsley, or turmeric instead of salt, okay? Try new things. Try, to, try one new fruit or vegetable every week. So you want to try to eat more whole foods, less refined and processed. So this means try to cook from scratch whenever you can. Try not to overcook your vegetables or process them in, a, in like a juice or a smoothie format. You want to also cook your vegetables with a lot of healthy, I mean a little bit, excuse me, a little bit of healthy fat like olive oil because the carotenoids that are found in the yellow, red, and orange fruits and vegetables are best absorbed with some fat. Okay, you want to eat whole pieces of fruit instead of the juice, as I had said previously with the orange versus the orange juice, and you want to try and eat brown rice and whole grain products, because white flour is considered a processed food, a refined food. So now I'm going to talk about flax seeds. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about flax seeds. What's so special about it? Well, flax seeds show promise as a food that reduces the risk of breast cancer and therefore possibly a recurrence of breast cancer. There are phytoestrogens in the plants, uh, in, in flax seed called lignans. They are derived from the plants and they mimic estrogen, human estrogen in the body. There's also alpha linoleic acid, which is an omega-3 fatty acid that's also a plant estrogen. Okay, but be, be careful because lignans are converted to phytoestrogens in the intestine. So flax seeds will not be as effective if you use antibiotics. Okay, so going back to the flax seed uh, again, you want to make sure that um, you have the flax seed in the right format. Okay, so the flax seed is again thought to be most effective for premenopausal women with estrogen receptor negative cancer. So ways that you can incorporate flax seeds into your diet. 
The whole flaxseed must be ground up for the body to take advantage of their properties. You want to buy whole, fresh flaxseed and grind them up using either a coffee grinder or a blender. You usually want to do it prior to use. So you can purchase it as an already ground up flax meal, but you want to refrigerate it or freeze it to keep it fresh. You must use it within three months of grinding. So you can, you can add it to foods. You can sprinkle it in your oatmeal. Again, you can make flaxseed pancakes. You can put it in soups or stews. Now, what about soy? Soy is another hot topic and uh, food item that gets um, mis misinformed and, and a lot of people are misinformed about soy. So what you should know is that currently the safety of high intakes of soy and other plant estrogens in the diet of breast cancer survivors is definitely an area of great debate among the scientists. So far, there have no human studies have been done. Okay, but what we do caution is that women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer should avoid soy supplements. Okay, not whole sources of soy such as tofu, soybeans, edamame, um, soy yogurt, miso soup, things like that. You can have those safely one to two servings a day. But when I say supplements, I mean that there's a soy powder out there. Um, you'll see it listed on the label of a lot of food products like energy bars or protein shakes. And it'll say soy protein isolate or soy protein concentrate. And the reason you want to avoid those items is because they contain high levels of soy that aren't measured. So they're concentrated and isolated from the plant. This way, if you eat the whole sources, the whole food sources, you, you know what you're getting. What about organic? Should we eat it? I definitely say it's recommended. If you can afford it and you can find it, definitely recommended to eat it, okay? But keep in mind that a plant-based diet, it has so many benefits. So eating produce, whether it's organic or not, is better than eating nothing at all. So if you can't find it, you can't afford it, by all means, don't worry about it. Eat your plants. Okay, as, as a consumer, how do you know? Well, I have a guide here that has been put together by the Environmental Working Group. The Environmental Working Group is the nation's leading environmental health research and advocacy organization. Um, they've done their homework and basically compiled these lists. The list on the left is referred to as the dirty dozen, even though the list has 15 uh, items on it because they, these items contain the highest amount of pesticides. Okay, The dirty dozen has tested for an average of 47 different chemicals and pesticides. And this list was put together after the USDA power washed these uh, fruits and vegetables with water. So I will read them to you. Basically, peaches, apples, sweet peppers, hot bell peppers, celery, cucumbers, imported nectarines, strawberries, cherry tomatoes, grapes, spinach, potatoes, collard greens, kale, zucchini, and summer squash. All of those have the highest level of pesticides. Some of them because they absorb them and some of them because it's on the, the skins. Okay, and the column on the right is referred to as the clean 15. You can safely buy these non-organic. So this is also a way to save some money and clear up a little bit of confusion when shopping for produce. The lowest in pesticides were onions, avocados, pineapples, mango, sweet peas, for some reason only frozen, asparagus, kiwi, cabbage, eggplant, cantaloupe, corn, grapefruit, mushrooms, papaya, and sweet potatoes. 
Well, what about supplements? People always ask me about supplements. They want to know why can't I just take a pill and get my vitamins and minerals that way, okay? But the body is very smart, and it, it's better able to utilize the nutrients from food than it is from dietary supplements. This is why I keep pushing a varied, healthy list of fruits and vegetables, so you can get all the vitamins and minerals from the foods you eat. So unlike our food systems, the United States government does not review the safety of dietary supplements. This includes all vitamins, minerals, and herbal products. Therefore, it is best to use dietary supplements that are reviewed by an independent third-party organization, such as the United States Pharmacopeia or Consumer Labs. So herbal ingredients also may interact with some other prescription or over-the-counter medicines. It's always best to consult either a dietitian, a pharmacist, or your doctor if you are interested in taking some, some vitamins and minerals. A multivitamin should not take the place of a healthy, well-balanced diet. But if you do need to take one, choose one that has 100% of the daily value of nutrients that are listed on the label. Anything in excess is not necessary. For the water-soluble vitamins, most of the excess gets excreted in the urine. But for the fat-soluble vitamins, such as A, D, E, and K, those vitamins build up in the body. They're stored in the fat tissue. So you don't want to take in an excess amount. Okay, when you do take a multivitamin, you want to take it with food because again, the fat-soluble vitamins are needed as part of the absorption process. So you will notice, though, when, when shopping, look for a USP on the label. There's a little symbol that says USP. All right, moving on to bone health. Bone health is super important. A lot, of, a lot of women, especially uh, postmenopausal women who have gone through treatment, need a little extra help when it comes to bone health. Okay, everybody could use extra help when it comes to bone health, whether premenopausal, postmenopausal, men, women. Okay, bones get their building blocks from multiple different nutrients. So again, the best way to get all of these nutrients is to eat a varied diet. Calcium you can find mostly in dairy foods, but if you don't eat dairy foods, don't panic. You can definitely try some other things like fortified foods. My favorite is almond milk, or you can try broccoli. Broccoli actually has calcium in it. Again, tofu has some calcium if you want to go for that, and other fortified products. Even canned fish, like canned and salmon has the little bones in it, which are soft enough to eat, and there's good sources of calcium. Vitamin D, you definitely want to try and get. Uh, it's a little hard to get, but you can get some from the fortified milk, eggs, and fish. Protein helps, and we've gone over the protein categories. This helps to build and repair tissues. Vitamin K also helps to form proper bone structure, and it gives it strength. So if you eat your vegetables, especially the green leafy ones, you're going to be fine. Magnesium helps to improve your bone density, and it helps to also process the calcium. So they all work together in synergy. You'll find magnesium in green leafy vegetables, potatoes, nuts, seeds, whole grains, and even chocolate. So the takeaway message from that slide is that you should definitely try and eat a varied diet and stick with a lot of fruits and vegetables. Okay, I wanted to highlight vitamin D because vitamin D is one of the nutrients that we don't seem to get enough of. We don't seem to get enough of because most of us now are so busy that we don't even get a chance to go outside and get the sunshine that we need. We all need about 15 minutes of sunshine a day. and um, we also put on sunscreen when we do go out, so we're, we're blocking our opportunity for vitamin D. 
vitamin D is also not found in large quantities in our foods. So this is where I will say taking a supplement can be very helpful. If you see this list, you see the, um, the, the recommended, current recommended amount is only 400 international units per day. So if you say were to eat salmon, three and a half ounces of salmon only gives you 360 international units a day. And milk, one cup of milk only gives you 98 international units. So we're definitely not consuming enough. But 400 international units is not even what is recommended. It is recommended if you look at labels, vitamin labels, but for strong bone health and other health benefits, now the recommendation is about 1,000 international units per day, anywhere up to 200,000, I mean, excuse me, 2,000 international units per day. That is the safe upper limit. So some people do get prescriptions from their doctors, which can be much larger amounts, but those are prescriptions from your doctor that have been um, given clear instructions to say take once a week or at certain times, but not, not every single day because, again, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin that can accumulate in your fat tissues. So what, what harms our bones? How, how, how can we avoid damage to our bones? Okay, a few lifestyle choices that we want to avoid are chronic alcohol use and smoking because those both not only diminish your bone health, but they're also risk factors for cancer. Surprisingly enough, sodium, too much sodium, which is what's found in a lot of processed foods, increases the amount of calcium excreted from the bones. Soda can interfere with bone health by displacing more beneficial calcium-rich drinks. So it can also interfere with calcium absorption. Basically, also you want to avoid excessive amount of supplements such as vitamin A because this might increase the breakdown of bone and interfere with vitamin D and beta-carotene. All right. So Back to fat. I had said earlier that I was going to cover this topic in detail. How do we balance our fat intake? You want to eat a low-fat diet. Everyone should eat a low-fat diet. Okay? It's not just a matter of eating a low-fat diet, but trying to choose the right type of fat. So the most healthy fats to choose from are flax seeds, walnuts, canola oil, salmon, and codfish. These are all rich in the omega-3 fatty acids which are also anti-inflammatory, and they can benefit everyone. You want to limit your intake of saturated fat and trans fat by cutting out things like whole fat dairy, like whole milk, cheeses that are full fat, and fast foods and processed foods. Okay, what about exercise? Why is it important? Well, it's very important, and everybody should try to do it. A healthy diet isn't the only thing that people should pay attention to when trying to be healthy. And I'll tell you why exercise is so important. Okay, long-term strenuous physical activity helps to decrease the risk of invasive breast cancer. Daily exercise is recommended to everyone to maintain good health. There is something in the body called the natural killer cells, and exercise helps to stimulate them. This means it's bad news for your cancer, but good news for you. Also, it's been shown that increased adiposity, which means fat in the body, and reduced physical activity are strong and independent predictors of death. So it's a good idea to, to get some physical activity. Okay, how much physical activity? Now, the, the recommendation is 30 plus minutes per day, at least five times a week. This is the ideal guideline, okay? And these guidelines were set, set by organization, organizations such as the American Institute for Cancer Research, American Cancer Society, and the Institute of Medicine. 
I gave you a lot, a lot of information today. So now I'm going to try and summarize the takeaway messages for you so you know what to remember. There are four very important points to remember if you want to stay healthy, increase your energy levels, and increase your overall well-being. The first is to adopt a plant-based diet. Okay, again, this includes lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds. Don't use dietary supplements to protect, protect yourself against cancer. Eat them in whole foods. Make choices by eating whole foods. When you process the vitamins and minerals, there's a lot of great plant chemicals that you're losing. And the body doesn't absorb the nutrients in the same way if you were to eat the whole sources of food. Number two, choose healthy fats. Okay, healthy fats are mainly the omega-3 fatty acids from the fatty fishes, olive oil, and flax seeds. Limit your intake of saturated fats and trans fat foods, mostly found in full fat dairy, processed foods, and fast foods. Message number three is to manage your weight and exercise. Since being overweight can lead to inflammation in the body and can cause the cells to change, it is in everyone's best interest to try to have a healthy weight. If you're trying to lose weight, try to watch your portion sizes, eat large amounts of fruits and vegetables, and try to eat fun foods only 10% of the time. You want to be physical, physically active to help with your weight loss process. But being physically active also has many other benefits, such as cardiovascular health, brain health, with protective effects against Alzheimer's disease, as well as boosting your mood. Okay, the fourth takeaway message is to improve your bone health. Again, the best way to get the calcium and vitamin D you need for bone health is to get it from the foods that are rich in those nutrients, such as dairy and fish. Stay away from lifestyle habits that damage bones, such as smoking and drinking excessive amounts of alcohol. This is one area if you need to take a supplement, such as a calcium and a vitamin D supplement for bone health, that I would say just do so, because we can't really seem to get enough in our diet. Make sure you do pick a supplement that has been USP certified. So thank you so much for your time. And with that, now I, I guess I will take questions. Thank you, Heidi. It was really some great information. I love the summation at the end because it just kind of brings it all together for us. So thank you oh, for that. Welcome. No problem. So a couple of questions. I think you may have answered this one, but um, so what about antioxidant supplements? Okay, meaning uh, antioxidants from in a pill? Right. Do you recommend antioxidant supplements or? Not, not. I don't recommend them if you get a balanced and varied diet. If you if you take in five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day, it's not really necessary. Okay. And what about flaxseed for women with estrogen positive receptors? Um, <clears throat> flaxseed, you know, flax isn't as strong as say the soy as a plant as a plant estrogen. So you can have it, but if you're concerned, again, the studies aren't clear. Um, so I, if you're concerned and you do have estrogen receptor positive and you're taking an estrogen um, reducing medication, you know, you might want to steer clear of the estrogen, the plant estrogens, just, just because it will give you peace of mind. Great. Okay. Does the designation organic automatically negate the presence of GMO ingredients in a product? Uh, that's a great question, and the answer is no. 
it has to say no GMOs on the label. It has to be clear. Those are two completely separate issues. Organic just means no pesticides or hormones used. Okay. What about, what's your opinion of chia seeds? <laughs> Chia seeds are very good, and I didn't include them as, as a strong omega-3, but they, they are a strong omega-3, and they're very healthy, so, and they have fiber. So I, I think they're a good thing. Okay. And what about, um, you talked about sugar. Is there a recommended daily allowance of sugar? And can you talk a little bit about sugar in dairy products? For example, there's, you know, like 16 grams of sugar in a small serving of yogurt. Right. Now, uh, first of all, the answer is no. There's not really a, a recommended amount of sugar because, you know, the idea is to have as little as possible. Um, but what I would say is that you should look for things that don't have a lot of sugar. When it comes to yogurts, for example, now we don't just look at sugar grams. When we're looking at a label, a lot of people tend to just look at the grams of sugar and say, oh, that's it, I can't have it. But you should also look at the ingredient list, such as high fructose corn syrup uh, used as the sweetening source. So it depends on the sweetener and it depends on you know what it is so again if you're not going to eat yogurt at all because you can't have your yogurt that has a little bit of fruit added to it that has has a sweet flavor i would say you're not doing yourself a favor because there's a lot of great benefits from yogurt um but try and pick the yogurt with the least amount of sugar you can you can certainly buy plain or vanilla and add in your own fruit that would be my recommendation as well, um, and add a little bit of a natural sweetener. Great. Well, I think we're out of time for today. So, Heidi, thank you so very much. I think we all learned thank a lot. You again. My pleasure. Thanks. So, um, if participants, if you wouldn't mind just uh, completing the short survey, at the end of the program just to let us know how we're doing that would be fantastic and as Heidi recommended um, she put together a bunch of recipes for us and I will email a PDF of those re the recipes to everyone that participated so thank you all very much and come and visit us at sharecancersupport.org thank you bye bye